Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, District Attorney Lisa Smithcamp, for joining us. Um, we're here with a really special, special guest here on why we do what we do, especially in light of what's been going on in the state of California recently. State of California is obviously very near and dear to Marcy's law because of Dr. Nicholas and Marcy herself, and the fact that California was the first state where Marcy's law was actually enshrined in a state constitution. Um, one of the things that has been grabbing national headlines in California recently is certain district attorneys and whether or not they're actually honoring their duty and their responsibility to victims and survivors and victims' families. Um, the people of uh, the city of San Francisco have spoken out and actually recalled the district attorney. There's another recall underway in Los Angeles. And I think one of the things that we should highlight um, is the district attorneys in California who are doing their job as DAs and as people who partner with the victim network and actually work with victims the way that Marcy's Law, um, the way that Marcy's Law talks about. Um, one of those district attorneys, when I was looking around the country, um, is Lisa Smithcamp. And there are some great prosecutors that we've had on, Daniel Dow from San Luis Obispo, Anne-Marie Schubert, Greg Totten, there are some, some absolute superstar prosecutors. And all roads recently have led to Lisa Smith camp in Fresno mm -hmm. County. Um, I wanna talk a little bit to Lisa about the concept of why we do what we do. And the interview series started with, you know, we, we would have um, many victims across the country talk to us um, about what actually brought them to the world of being a victim advocate, whether it's um, wh whether it's district attorneys, attorneys general, victim advocates, um, survivors of, um, of terrible tragedies. And um, when I talked with Lisa about that, uh, Lisa really, uh, really connected with me when she talked about the fact that she keeps a manila envelope in mm -hmm. her office with different stories and different notes and thank you notes uh, that keep her inspired. Uh, first of all, Lisa, could you tell us a little bit about why you became a prosecutor and you've been a prosecutor for almost a quarter of a century now is that right yes that's right over 25 years i have been and um, thank you peter first for having me on it's such an honor uh, just to even be in the realm of, of uh, to be considered with one of the as one of the people that you would want to talk to um, on this program so I'm, I'm honored to be here and i want to thank you for that but yes i you know i became a prosecutor because i think as a, a child, I just always was, I was raised by my parents to sort of stand up for the underdog and to do the right thing every day. And so it was a sort of a natural flow, you know, for me, just for how I was raised and what my personality was. Um, and it's just, it's a pleasure and an honor every day to get to be a voice for victims um, who sometimes don't have a voice of their own. And, uh, and I, it's funny you mentioned the, the manila envelopes because I actually have one for every year that I've been a prosecutor. And some of them have two or three and some of them are stuffed with you know 20 or 30 cards or letters that I've received. But I, I do go back frequently and read those uh, you know, when I have down days or I think like, what am I doing here? Why do I do this work? Uh, and I read, I read the statements and the letters and the thoughts from the victims and it just keeps me, keeps me going every day. And I, I will say that one of the things that drew me to your office and to you specifically is just your great record as a prosecutor and, and the, the, way that you, um, the way that you handle uh, victims and victims' families and walk them through the entire process. And then the more I got to know you, the more I realized that that started when you were an assistant district attorney, not just as district attorney. Yeah. Um, and uh, we, we got to talking about several stories. And one story is one of the most incredible stories where a victim has come completely full circle. And it is, it, it's really an embodiment of why we do what we do. And I, I want you to tell us uh, the story of Rachel Baskin and how Rachel Baskin first came in, into your life. Okay, so I was on the homicide team and uh, I was on online looking at some news uh, clips that had been, um, uh, put on about my case uh, in preparation for it. And I saw a news article uh, that had that indicated there were three people. There was an attempted murder case out of a small town in our county uh, named, called Reedley. And it was just very intriguing to me because I had spent a good portion of my career prosecuting domestic violence cases. 
And just coincidentally that day, um, the administrative people in the office came in and asked me if I wanted to leave the homicide unit and go over to the domestic violence unit to supervise the unit. So they were sort of offering me this promotion. And I kind of hemmed and hawed because I was just getting comfortable in my homicide assignment. And I said, I will let, I will go. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know that I had a choice, but I said, I'll go if, if I can have this case that I read about uh, on, online. I want to see uh, this, something about the case just was enthralling to me. So we sort of made that bargain. And I went over, uh, made the transition within the next week and was able to meet Rachel and her mom. Um, at, at a pretrial hearing, the case had just been uh, starting. And so I came in um, after the arraignment and uh, she had a tracheostomy here and so did her mom. Uh, they had both had their throats sliced open by um, her Rachel's ex-husband. Uh, they were in the process of a divorce and her brother had been shot um, right over the eye. Uh, Rachel had been grazed with a, with a shot too from a firearm. And so it was a case. If I could just bring you back, Lisa, sure. to how, how it all began with Rachel and you, I remember you were telling me the story about how Rachel first started to date her, her husband, who soon became her husband. He was yes. a Marine. Yes. And um, it was a long distance relationship at first. And then they became married. And then yes. he moved down to um, uh, moved San, Diego. To San Diego to Camp Pendleton, right. I believe. I believe so. Yes. And yeah. And, um, she, and she, she as I got to. Yeah, as I got to know her, I got to know her story. She was a you know small town girl living here, and he was across the the nation. Uh, her roommate was dating his roommate, and they started a long distance relationship that developed. He moved to San Diego, and they eventually were married here in Fresno County. Uh, she became pregnant, and uh, they were expecting a child. And uh, he was living at the base, and she was living here in Reedley. But after the child was born, she said, "You know, I really want to live together. I want to be there with you." And he was pretty hesitant about that, but she went down there and things kind of got soured. And uh, she decided that she needed to leave the relationship. He was very controlling, showing a lot of signs and, and uh, signals of domestic violence. There wasn't you know, heavy beatings or anything like that, but he was very controlling and it was a very upsetting situation. So she moved back home to Reedley and she initiated um, divorce proceedings. And she was actually a paralegal at the time that all of this was happening. And she was actually working in a family law firm. So uh, she initiated the procedures and uh, they were fighting over, uh, disagreeing, I should say, over the financial arrangements for child support. So she asked for a reduced amount. He still was hesitant. And the next thing she knew, uh, he was um, in her home at five in the morning, dressed in all of his military fatigues, with armed with a, a knife and a gun. And if I could just held, stop, stop yeah. you for a second. That was, sure. um, that was, 13 years ago, almost to the day today. That's correct. July, it was, the, 16th, July, July the 16th will be the anniversary of the incident. Yes. And, and so Rachel at that point had moved back in with her mom. Correct. In, 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 in Reedley. And just, just to paint the picture for the people who aren't familiar with Reedley, Reedley is, uh, is, is, is relatively quiet, is it not? Yes. It's a very small farming community, a lovely community. You know, they have their, their normal issues. Um, with some some juvenile gang crime, but but not you know it's not a it's not a hotbed for crime for sure. It's a very small, sweet community. So so Rachel was living back with her mom. The divorce proceedings had begun. They were talking about uh, they were disagreeing on child support. Um, her little daughter Layla was 18 months old in the morning right. of July 16, 2009. Was fast asleep yeah. in another room. Uh, Rachel, Rachel was there, her mom was there, and Rachel's brother, who was, I believe, a corrections officer at the time, off duty. That's correct. And actually, Rachel and her mom were both living with uh, her brother. He was really the, the financial support. Uh, her mom had had a, a couple of car accidents and some unfortunate incidents and had some health issues. So he was living with his mom. Uh, and when Rachel left her marriage in San Diego, she and the baby also moved in with Christopher, uh, who's, you know, the brother of the year, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and uh, and so they all four were living together. They were actually in the process of moving when this when this whole thing happened, uh, because they were going to go to a, a a bigger place so that they could all live more comfortably. Um, and and the morning of July the sixteenth, uh, Rachel went out to the garage where the, the washing machine and dryer was located, which was part of her daily ritual for getting ready, as he knew. And she would uh, instead of ironing her clothes, she would spin them in the the steam cycle of the dryer uh, to get them ready because she was a professional woman. Uh, getting ready to go to work. And when she did, she found him outside in the garage dressed in, you know, the fatigues that in the, in the clothing that she oftentimes washed herself uh, for him while they were married. And he held all three of them hostage for some time until he finally 
uh, it, he finally got the courage to do what he came to do, which was to try to attempt to kill all of them. Um, and again, he, he, he shot Rachel, shot at Rachel, grazed her head. She ran for the baby. Um, you know, obviously her mom and her brother reacted. Christopher was shot in the, in the forehead over the eye. Uh, as her mom, Linda, tried to exit the house, he grabbed her from behind, pulled her head and sliced her throat with a knife, uh, sort of, you know, a la um, Nicole Brown Simpson style, sadly, um, and, and, and violently. Uh, she was able to exit the home, and then he went back after Rachel, uh, grabbed her, and she also had her neck sliced open. Somehow, some way, Rachel was able to get to her baby, even though she was, you know, gravely, gravely injured. Um, and I think that that at that time, it's probably safe to say that the defendant went into some kind of a shock because he stayed at the he stayed at the residence. He had parked his car around the corner, but he didn't even make an attempt to flee, which was very interesting to me always through the litigation of the case. Uh, Rachel was able to get the baby and her, um, her brother had um, been shot, but he was able to subdue uh, Baskin from further injuring them. And both Rachel and her, her wife, her, I'm sorry, Rachel, the wife and Linda, the mother were able to get out of the house uh, and, call, and call for help. And that's when uh, the EMTs arrived, the ambulances and uh, Rachel was airlifted. Her mother was transported by ambulance as was Christopher. And uh, they were all saved, really, by by the grace of God. Yeah, and the the doctor actually um, described it as a miracle. He did. Uh, it was a a very uh, emotional moment, you know, in the courtroom because doctors don't don't speak like that, you know, they don't. Uh, and I had asked him off the record, you know, what? How did these people survive? And he said it was miraculous. And I said, would you say that on a stand? And he said, probably not. But there was not a, a medical. There wasn't a medical reason why they should not. They should have survived. Um, I didn't even know at the time uh, that I prosecuted this case that we have an external and internal jugular vein, but we do. And Rachel and Linda's external jugular veins were were severed, but their internals were not, which is why the EMTs were able to save them. And by the time they did get to the medical center, uh, the doctor who testified. Uh, was the director of emergency medicine. He had three, three, had three uh, surgical rooms waiting for them uh, when they got there because the EMTs were able to communicate the, the level of, of severity of the bleeding and the injury, and they were all saved. Uh, and so we proceeded on a case, uh, litigating a case uh, with three counts of attempted murder with, with gun and knife enhancements. And uh, after several, several, several years of uh, very aggressive um, attempts at negotiations and, you know, sort of wranglings with the defense attorney, we finally got to trial. And uh, it was kind of funny because the, uh, the judge had asked, you know, is there any settlement offers in this case? And I said, no, your honor, there, there are no offers uh, because it was just that good of a case. And I had, you know, Marcy's law had just been passed. And I had always been the type of prosecutor that sort of maybe went at that time, you know, a little bit overboard, a little bit, you know, maybe blurring a little bit of those ethical boundaries that we used to have. Because as prosecutors, as you know, uh, we don't have um, attorney client privilege. These are not people that are, are their clients. They're not, they're not our clients. We don't have clients. They're, they're victims, but they're witnesses. And so we sort of have to keep this, you know, wall between us, if you will. Uh, that, that doesn't exist in civil uh, or family law type situations. Uh, but after Marcy's law, it really allowed prosecutors like me who have personality and heart and, and a heart for victims to you know, get closer to them. And I think that the success of the prosecution of this case um, and, and the fact that Rachel was willing to stick it out with me was because of that bond that we had. Because the minute that I met her, I just, there was something special about her and her family. Um, and I felt the need to, to really protect them. That was my, my goal was to try to recreate the safety for them that they felt in their life because I couldn't take away the pain. I couldn't take away the injury. I couldn't take away the trauma. You know, that was all theirs to own and process. But what I wanted to do is not only make the offender accountable, but I wanted to create an environment for them that they felt safe to function in the world again. 
And, and I think that Marcy's law was something that, you know, allowed us to do that. It encouraged prosecutors to get out there and to engage with victims and to, to welcome them into the conversations about the charges, the cases, you know, how we work what we do, why we settle cases, why we try cases, and really how the system works and to give them that empowerment of a voice. Because when you, you know, we always, we always say Rachel really did, and Linda lost their voice because they were damaged in that area of their body. But, you know, metaphorically speaking, even people who aren't injured to that point where they, you know, they, they, can, they can't emotionally speak. Um, that's really, I think, what Marcy's Law did for so many of us is to encourage us to, to make those connections with victims, which, which, you know, helps the case. And that's always a good thing if you have a good, strong relationship with your, with your victim and they trust you, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll come to court and they'll show up and they get in the process. Because it's very easy as a victim to just want to put it behind you and move on and not participate, you know, in the, in the, in the process. It's very difficult. You have to relive it over and over and over again. And it's a hard job to be a victim of a crime. It's a hard job. It's a hard job to come to court and, you know, the continuances that we have. And especially because, you know, the defendants basically drive the train of time. The people and the victims always have to be ready. You know, we have very few opportunities in the law, especially here in California, uh, to, to continue cases. We don't have the ability like the defense attorneys do. Uh, to say, oh, I need more time for investigation, or I need more time for, for interviewing witnesses, or checking alibis, or checking mental defenses. We don't have all of those opportunities. So she, she was very patient. The family was very patient with me. And I think it was because we had that opportunity to sort of bond and get close, um, that, that the, the success of the prosecution, where he was convicted of everything that he was charged with, was sentenced to 77 years to life. And um, not only was that sort of, you know, a, a piece of their justice, but uh, the day that he was, you know, he was convicted and then he was sentenced and then he was here um, in Fresno for a week or so after. Uh, but I had a, a friend of mine who was doing transport from the Fresno County Jail to the California Department of Corrections. And he called me and he said, hey, I saw that case, you know, that you had. It was in the news for a long time. He said, I just want you to know. I have Dijon Baskin on the bus today, meaning that he was taking him from the jail to the prison. And I said, okay, thank you so much for letting me know. And I called Rachel and Linda, left him a message. And Linda called me back, who was Rachel's mom and said, Lisa, she said, tonight, I'm gonna sleep through the night for the first time, knowing that he's you know, gone, he's, it's done. We're, you know, he's in prison. And even though he had been in jail in Fresno incarcerated, you know, with a, with a very high or maybe even no bail, I can't remember right off the top of my head, and he wasn't going anywhere, she knew that. Just the fact that it was over and he was out of the county, she said, and she called me the very next day and said, guess what, I slept through the night for the first time since this happened. And you know that, you can't replace that, that's gold. It's really an amazing, an amazing story. And what you do as district attorney to give victims like Rachel a voice, and you've been doing it as an assistant district attorney and as the district attorney, and Marcy's law gives them the constitutional right to be present, gives them the constitutional Absolutely. right to have a voice and to be heard. And like you said, it empowers them. And, it's, and then you, as a prosecutor who does all the things that a great prosecutor, prosecutor should do, puts the constitutional rights of Marcy's law in action. And it lets a victim see what Marcy's law and what victims' rights actually look like when they're actually put into practice. And this is where the story usually ends, and that's a beautiful <laughs> piece of closure that you can give to a victim. But the story really just began at that point for Rachel Baskin. Um, you empowered her, you gave her a voice, literally and figuratively. Like you were saying, her throat was slashed. Her mom's throat was slashed, they said, almost in the exact same spot in the trachea. Yes. Then you gave her a figurative voice and a literal voice. And then Rachel's life took an even different turn, this time really for the positive. And by all accounts, it really is attributable to the fact that she saw you in action. She saw you give her a voice and she started to pay it back by showing you that you really became a role model for her. And then she said she wanted to go to law school. Tell us what happened. Yeah. Then. yeah, well, you know, she was already a paralegal, very bright. And, you know, just seeing her on the stand was amazing because her ability to recall things, not just about what had happened, 
um, you know, to her during the course of her relationship and, and, and to recall the facts of that horrible evening. But, you know, she was also just so great with the, with the, the, the aspects of the, the litigation and the attempted to, to settle the, um, the, the money and the child support issues in her professional world as a paralegal. I just saw this amazing person. The problem was she didn't have the self-esteem and she didn't have the belief in herself. She did not come from a family that was, you know, educated and which, which I didn't either. I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. Um, and so she, she had this image of herself that she was less than, you know, other people. And so I, I told her, she, she just mentioned in passing one time, oh, I've always wanted to be a prosecutor, but I could never go to law school. And I said, well, here, let's get through this trial and then we'll talk about some things because if I can do it, you can do it. And, you know, there were many times that I would discuss with her the, the frustrations, you know, because it's obviously hard work uh, and it's a lot of sacrifice for your family. It's a lot of personal sacrifice that you have to go through. But and I shared all that, the good, the bad, the ugly with her. And at the end of the case, uh, she decided that she wanted to pursue law school. And so she uh, working full time, being a, a, a full time, you know, single parent and also a financial contributor, along with her brother to helping her mom, you know, stay on her feet. Uh, she enrolled in Fresno Pacific University. She received her bachelor's degree and I was honored to attend her graduation. And uh, she applied to San Joaquin College of Law, which is my alma mater. Uh, she got student loans and did all that you know, stuff that a lot of young law students have to do. Uh, she graduated from San Joaquin, did very well while working full time. Uh, and you were at my graduation running. too, weren't you? Oh yes, I was at her graduation with bells on. And uh, we, you know, we, we, we became, we became friends and, uh, you know, she was cute because during the litigation, the case went on for many years before we finally got it to trial, but uh, she would invite me to her daughter's birthday parties, you know, before the case was over. And I would just tell her, I'd love to come, but I can't, you know, because we do have to have those, those boundaries. Uh, and so after the case was over and the appeal was finalized, then we really were able to develop a personal relationship. And so uh, I had the honor and privilege of uh, taking care of her daughter. One time, uh, we, I took her to, to on a family vacation with my son while her mom took the bar exam. And, uh, and now Layla is a thriving, you know, 14-year-old, preteen, saucy, brilliant, just like her mom, wants to go to MIT and be an engineer. Uh, and so I had the, the opportunity to, to spend a few days with her while, while Rachel took the bar. And uh, when she passed the bar, uh, she, uh, she came to work here at the DA's office. And uh, on September uh, 7th of last year, 2021, I got to swear her in as a deputy district attorney. And it was, um, it was a very emotional day for me. I still get emotional about it uh, when I think about how far she's come. But I think, you know, everybody talks about, oh, you did so much for Rachel. But, you know, it, it, really, Peter, if you boil it down and you look at who got the best deal, it really was me because Rachel inspired me so many times. You know, she, she is not only a courageous person, but the most beautiful thing about Rachel and Linda and Christopher is they are kind people. And even though they had this horrible thing happen to them, it has not bittered them. They are positive and, you know, still very compassionate um, and, and happy. They're happy people. And so sometimes, you know, so many of us who have so many blessings in the world, whether it's healthy children or nonviolent relationships or productive lives and careers, you know, we get down and we say, oh, I don't have this or I don't have that or my life is so hard. And so Lisa Sondergaard Smith Camp gets into those days too. And when I do, I think of Rachel and I think of everything that she has brought to my life. And I think, wow, if my, if I think my day is hard, you know, how, how is her day? And I watch her now, and uh, in fact, I, I had lunch with her yesterday, and we were chatting a little bit, and she just came back from a trip with another young prosecutor um, in, our, in, our, in our office, and they went on a girls' week to the, to the South and had such a great time. And you know, those were things that she wouldn't have ever dreamed of doing as a single mom working as a paralegal in a civil firm. But now that she's an attorney, and she's on her feet, and she's paid you know, her loans back, and she bought her own home, and she has a new car, and you know, she's really doing well uh, financially and emotionally. She's raising a wonderful girl. That's just such a uh, such an inspiration to me. And if it wasn't for Marcy's law, you know, I don't know that I would have able to to form those bonds with her. But that 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 constitutional push and that 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 emphasis on finally somebody saying victims matter um, just changed the world for for me as an individual prosecutor and for the Fresno County DA's office. And it breaks my heart 
that there are other offices um, in this in this state of ours that that don't care. They 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 claim to care about victims, but they don't. Um, I think you know you might have seen the news last night. Gascon has now said that he's not sending anybody to parole hearings, and victims aren't going to be rep recognized. And it's just it's a mess. These these people are imposter DAs, and I am so looking forward to uh, to hearing whether or not he will be recalled because the people in San Francisco finally woke up and realized that. The ideals of these imposter DAs are not good for public safety, and they certainly are not serving victims. And they are actually violating the, the, the Constitution of, of California because of Marcy's law. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's one of the most important points to underscore is the, these are people who are elected uh, that are actually violating the Constitution that they take an oath and swear to uphold. 100%. 100%. And, um, you know, one of the things that Rachel's brother, Chris, said after you had successfully tried the case when you talked about uh, the most important thing, and he was talking about closure and what does he do and what do you do to go forward, and he said, the most important thing is to continue to live your life or else he, meaning uh, Dijon Baskin, wins. Yes. And clearly, everyone has continued to go on and not just live their life and not just survive, but really to thrive. Um, and with you as a role model, it is really one of the most incredibly inspirational stories in the world of prosecution and victims' rights that I've ever, oh, ever come thank across. You. And, thank you. People tease us all the time that we should be a Lifetime movie. And I said, all right, I'll agree only if Julia Roberts plays Lisa. <laughs> so and I'm sure I'm sure Rachel has her ideal, too, who, who could play her. So if anybody out there wants to write our screenplay, just let us know. <laughs> well, well, the, the other the other thing that um, there, and there's footage out there all over um, all over the Internet. And you, you talked about swearing in Rachel as an assistant district attorney, uh, that little baby girl who had no idea what was going on when she was 18 months old, almost 13 years ago today, when when the when the defendant entered that house, um, she was there. Her brother, Chris, Rachel's brother, Christopher, was there. Rachel's mom was there. You were all there together. You swore her in. And just try to describe for me what you felt when you saw that little girl, Layla, put the pen on her mom's lapel. So my goal of the day was not to cry. <laughs> um, and, and I think I made it through without any tears actually falling. But it was, it was just... Um, you know, it was such a, a heartwarming moment because, you know, Layla was only 18 months old when it happened and she didn't really know, you know, a, a lot about what had happened. And obviously she saw the scar on her mom's neck and, you know, Rachel had gone through a process of, you know, when to tell her what, but what Layla did know um, is how hard her mom worked she was, it was a long process. You know, this is not something that happened overnight. And, and she watched those 10 years of struggle. She watched her mom struggle through reliving this through the preliminary hearing and the trial and the sentencing and waiting for the appeal to be affirmed and all of those things. And then her mom's college and then her mom's law school. So, you know, I know too, just from my own personal experience, whether it was my parents putting me through law school and helping me financially and emotionally, and then my own family. And, the, and sometimes my kids suffer when I'm out helping other kids, you know, when I'm out, especially now as the elected DA, when I'm out speaking to a service club, you know, at seven o'clock at night and I'm not home doing homework with my kids, my kids are suffering uh, or, or, or maybe not suffering, but you know, they're, they're not having me there a hundred percent of the time. And I've raised them to know that I am helping other children. Um, and thankfully, you know, that's worked out well for me in the sense that I've, you know, I think I've raised kind, uh, compassionate children. But seeing Layla there that day, knowing the sacrifices that my family made for me and that my family continues to make every day for my career and so that I can serve other victims, it was just sort of made everything come together and say, this is why I do what I do. Because the rewards for the individual prosecutors personally are there also. And, and they don't happen in every case. You may have 5,000 cases where you never hear from a victim or you don't have a victim who will engage with you or you know you, you try to extend yourself and they're, they're just not receptive for whatever reason. And you have to accept that and move on. But when you do find the cases where you can, and most of the times we do find that victims are receptive. And you know, I, I think the thing that's the most interesting after you're making me feel like a really old lady saying a quarter of a century that I've been doing this work um, is that, most of the times when you have the opportunity to sit across the desk from a victim and say, what do you want to see happen here? 
it's not what you would think. It's not like, you know, they say, oh, I want him to go to prison for the maximum amount of time. And that happens once in a while. But most of the victims that I have encountered, whether it's been sexual assault, domestic violence, child abuse, child, um, you know, child sexual assaults uh, or robberies or burglaries, is they say, you know what, I just don't want this to happen to anybody else. And, well, and that, to me, you know, speaks volumes about victims of crime. You know, yes, do they want justice? Sure. Do they want someone to be accountable and punished for their crime? Yes. But it's not a, it's not a revenge mode. It's just really, I want to participate because I don't want this to happen to other people. And I think that's the empowerment, you know, that we get from, from, from prosecutors, from victims as prosecutors, uh, yeah, to, yeah. to know that we just need to do the right thing and make people accountable. And the, the, the paying it forward concept in this particular case is really just so amazing when you think that you empowered Rachel and you gave her a voice and now she is going to do the same thing and empower other victims and give yeah. them a voice. And, now, and, and I have to, Peter, I have to remind her every day that she did all the hard work. I just, I just held her hand. That's all. I just, you know, I turned the light on for her and I told her she could. And I think that's the thing, you know, I think Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're always going to be right. And so sometimes, you know, you just have to have one person who tells you, you know, I can look back on my academic career and there was one professor in college who gave me that oomph, you know, who just said, you can do it. And, and I believed her. So, so I wanted to be that person for Rachel. And I, you know, I have a few other victims too that I keep in contact with. And even now that I've been out of the courtroom in that capacity for, you know, eight years, um, I still have victims that come and visit me. They come and see me. Uh, they they pop in the office. They send me birthday cards, and it's just it's it's really a great. It's just being a prosecutor is a great career, and 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 the victims are really the best part of it. And the fact that you believed in her, and you mentioned Henry Ford, and Henry Ford um, when he talks about his success, he talks about how he would stay up late at night and trying to figure out how he was going to get accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. And you remember one night he was just about ready to give up, and somebody came in that he had great respect for. And he said, I'll never forget the words that he told me. He said it was four words that changed my life and changed the course of history and for, for him. And it was, I believe in you. And it's funny you mentioned Henry Ford because it's exactly what you did yeah. for Rachel. And, and, and Layla is one of the most incredible parts of this, this story. When I saw the footage of her pinning the, the, the pen as, as a prosecutor on her mom with you there and Rachel's mom there and Rachel's brother, Christopher there, um, I, I couldn't help but think that Layla, like you said, is going to see, as she gets older, she's going to see her mom as the hardworking hero that she is. Oh, for sure. And she gets even older than that. And she realizes and she puts all the pieces together. She's going to have not one, but two heroes because she's going to realize what you did as well and how it made it everything oh, possible. Thank you. So, That's very kind. But she's got enough hero in her mama every single day. And boy, she is a smart, capable young lady. And I'm so excited to see what happens for her as she grows. She may be a future prosecutor in Fresno County. <laughs> she might be all of our bosses someday. <laughs> the, three, the three greatest prosecutors ever, Lisa <laughs> and Rachel and Layla. Um, and, and my hope is that Rachel can join us um, very soon too, because I would love to have Rachel tell her story. Oh, I'm sure she would love to join you. She is very open to uh, to sharing her story. She's done uh, some panels with me over the years. And uh, Layla is now of an age to where she knows what happened. And, uh, you know, that was sort of a gradual thing uh, going along along the path that we did. And, and Rachel was just amazing as a mom telling her, you know, enough to, to keep her uh, her relationship with her daughter, honest, but also, you know, being cognizant of her age and what she was able to, what she was able to understand. And so, uh, so that's a process also, you know, she's a teenager now and, uh, she's got Google and she's got the ability to get on a, a computer. Uh, and so, so that's a process too, that we're both going through with her now. And, you know, my, my relationship with Layla is changing too, because for a very long time, she just knew me as her mom's friend. She didn't know who I was. She didn't know what my role was. And, and now that she knows, you know, we're going through a little bit of a development process, too, with our relationship. And, uh, you know, as soon as she gets to be a little bit older, we'll probably have some more conversations. And, uh, of course, I always defer to Rachel to what she wants to tell because it's her daughter. But, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mutual, um, it's a, a, a mutually 
just beneficial relationship all the way around. I'm part of their family. They're part of mine. And now Rich is part of the DA family. So it's, it's a win-win all the way around. Well, I just wanted to thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for your commitment. You're a hardworking DA. You're also a hardworking mom. And, and thanks for making the world a better place. Thank you so much. That's so kind. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Have a great day. You too. Take good care. You too.